Well, good afternoon, everyone. As uh, folks filter into this first digital workshop for Episcopal Parish Network of 2023, welcome. Uh, my name is Joe Swimmer. I'm the executive director of Episcopal Parish Network. Apparently, uh, everyone does not know that we um, are the new uh, and even better version of the Consortium of Doubt Episcopal Parishes, or SEEP. Um, EPN changed its name last year, and um, we are pleased to be going into our first full year as EPN and to start off with this session on excellence in church communications. Um, we have a stellar group of folks to share um, their thoughts, their wisdom with you today. Uh, I do hope that you will use this as a springboard uh, to learn more and join us uh, lear learning more. Uh, by joining us in Jacksonville in just a couple of months, March 8th through the 11th, for our 38th annual conference um, to be taking place at the High Regency in St. John's Cathedral. Our uh, communicators pre-conference, which we're doing in coordination with Episcopal Communicators, our partner on this session, um, will include uh, two really wonderful thought leaders, uh, Judy um, Smith of Smith and Company, apparently the basis for the character, uh, lead character in Scandal by Shonda Rhimes, and uh, Amanda Skofstad of the National Church, uh, the DFMS. So it should prove a wonderful pre-conference. Um, but that's enough for me today. Now I'm going to turn it over to Alan Yarbrough to take the lead um, from the Episcopal Communicator's perspective and thank all of our panelists. Enjoy the session. Thank you, Joe, very much, and thank you for your willingness uh, for the EPN to host this session. I'm um, Alan Yarbrough. My role in the church is the church relations officer for the Episcopal Church Office of Government Relations. Uh, I do a lot of communications in that role, um, and as such, I'm a member of Episcopal Communicators and the vice chair of the board there. Um, I'm really excited to, have, uh, to be on this call with some amazing communicators across the church. Uh, we mentioned award-winning in the description. These are all folks who received a Poly Bond Award uh, in the previous awards uh, um, competition within Episcopal Communicators last year. Um, so excited to hear from them, focusing on excellence in church communication and newsletters uh, and websites. Um, Joe mentioned the Episcopal Parish Network Conference and Communicators Pre-Conference already. Um, the Episcopal Communicators will have our own conference later on in April at Camp Allen, and I'll get that registration in the chat uh, later on. Um, we'll also, we are open for uh, renew membership renewal and new memberships with the Fiscal Communicators as well. Um, so just really cool synergy here. Um, I like the energy that's gone into this between uh, between the collaborations in these two organizations. So uh, grateful to, to be a part of this. Um, without further ado, let's turn over to our, our first segment, uh, which will focus on newsletters. Um, so Katie, uh, Lori, and Holt, you were all were, were award winners in this segment, uh, uh, again, in the Polybonds last year. Um, so you start by introducing yourselves um, and take it away. Sure. I I'm Katie Forsyth. I serve as the canon for evangelism and networking in the Episcopal Dioceses of Eastern Michigan and Western Michigan. I, I don't know, does it make sense to have Lori and Holt also introduce yourselves now also? Sure. Yeah. Sure. We're going to introduce ourselves and then... Great. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Alan. Um, hi, I'm Lori Blewett. I am the Director of Communications at St. David's in Austin, Texas, and um, I am one of a great team of two, and I'm excited to um, invite um, my wonderful counterpart, Holt, to introduce herself as well. Thanks, Lori. Uh, I'm Holt Haley Walker. I'm the Assistant Director of Communications at St. David's in Austin, and um, uh, shall we move on to the um, to back to Katie so that she can answer the first yeah. question? Great. Yeah, that works. So, um, Katie, and, and then for Lori and Holt afterwards, uh, just kick us off by sort of talking through your process of of creating and maintaining your newsletter, um, the impact or the mood that you're hoping for, you know, in that communications product. Thank you. And I'm watching the chat also, and glad to recognize a lot of a lot of friends in the chat. Uh, so I, as Canon for Evangelism and Networking, do hold communications as one of the many hats that I have the honor and privilege of wearing. And uh, we have a bi-weekly emailed newsletter for the dioceses. And we use MailChimp, it goes out every other week. We have about 2,500 recipients. 
and um, we've run this newsletter in that format for around well almost 10 years in eastern michigan and then i started working for two dioceses in a dual role with a dual newsletter uh, about five years ago and so that's an extra strange aspect about what we're doing up in the mitten state when we're looking at um, the newsletter, the impact, the mood that I'm aiming for, I go back to our strategic communications plan, which we did with a firm back in 2013. But core ideas, core tones that I want to hit in our newsletter tend to be um, keeping things less hierarchical. So in a, in a diocesan newsletter, emphasizing lay leadership, emphasizing collaboration, and emphasizing the impact and influence of all members of our dioceses on the whole of our dioceses. And so you'll even notice that the name of our publications is The Feast. Uh, so the tagline is everyone has a place at the table and that's what we're trying to set the tone as in the content that we raise up, the photography that we use and the language that we use. I have a few set of core ministry areas that I try to highlight in the stories that we choose to tell. And so if somebody contacts me and says, hey, Katie, we have a news, we have something for the newsletter for you. Will you advertise our bake sale? I have the ability to say, you know what, it's not the it's not the place where I would advertise your bake sale um, without having some explanation of is the bake sale supporting something that's um, going toward advocacy for anti-violence? Is it something that is intended as a as a feeding ministry? Then that changes things. And so our, our core areas of stories that we tell are anti-racism, LGBTQ inclusion, hunger, violence, anti-addiction, and then creation care. And again, it, if those stories have extra themes of being lay led or telling stories of collaboration, those also tend to be things that I will focus on also. And so that's in the stories that we choose to tell. And then it's also uh, when I look at photos that have been submitted, because I get a lot of submissions, um, that's one of the things about being a diocesan newsletter is that I get a lot of content from a lot of different corners. And I get a lot of photos from a lot of different corners. And I've uh, gotten this stereotype in my office of being mean about cakes. If I get a, a photo of somebody's just like a cake that somebody had made as thanks for a thing, I am uh, not going to use the photo of the cake. I say, can you give me a human behind the cake at least? If I don't get the human in it, I'm probably not going to use it. So um, content driven decisions, know what qualifies so that you can say no to things that you should say no to. And I think in a similar vein as that, having the backup from your team, your coworkers, and your supervisor, so that when they're in other rooms doing the work that they need to do, that they're not um, going to promise something to the people they're working with that you can't fulfill. I hope that makes <laughs> I hope that makes sense. And then uh, my tips for basics of newsletters. Um, one of the things that we pay attention to because of the community that we serve, the community that we serve is not strange in the Episcopal Church and that I've got some tech phobic people. I've got some folks who will not use email um, and or won't subscribe to diocesan emails and so they get it through their church but the dynamic that that creates for me is that i will always use a white background for a newsletter because i know that it's getting printed off and so if people aren't reading it on the screen and i know that they're gonna you know post it on a bulletin board at the church or i've got priests who will print it off and mail it out to some of their parishioners i know i'm always going to do a white background so that i'm not abusing their their printer cartridges and the other piece is there are plenty of opportunities to let other people do the work for you. And so it'll be um, if I have a if I have a low news week or I'm having a really particularly busy week, then I can't spend hours and hours on a newsletter. I will often look to Episcopal News Service. I'll look to the Episcopal Policy Network. I will look to all of these different organizations that I know align with my content areas that I can pull existing stories from that our our folks will have some engagement and interest in so let others do the work for you sometimes that's what i have written down i'm happy to answer any other questions also
good, Katie. Appreciate it. Yeah, if folks have questions, please uh, use the chat um, for that. And Katie, a couple asked if you could uh, share a link to the newsletter. Um, so Lori and Holt, uh, over to you all. Um, what it, describe the process for for maintaining a newsletter and uh, and jump into sharing some some holistic and content driven tips uh, for creating a newsletter and some uh, some specific sort of granular tips like Katie shared. Yeah, um, so I'll just jump in and just kind of explain how Holt and I divide communications work in our department. And so um, for um, ongoing periodic publications like newsletters and the website and social media, um, those are things that Holt maintains. And so we have a weekly meeting where we talk about um, priorities and events and things that are coming up that we want to make sure that we're um, addressing in our different communications avenues. And um, I'll let Holt share her process uh, because she's got an excellent process that I think um, might be helpful for other communicators. Thanks, Lori. Um, we began uh, with a process that was um, many stakeholders sending one central person all of their information and then that person compiling and disseminating the information as best they could. And we have now evolved to a process where we've become a part of the ministry planning process by setting seasonal meetings based on the liturgical calendar, where we discuss content um, and information cycles as a group uh, well before it needs to be published. And so that gives us an opportunity to look back at what we've done in previous years and see if we can reuse some of that content, um, how it aligns with our current goals and missions, and uh, provides the opportunity for some synergy between ministries. So there's uh, some sharing of the workload. And then we have a central source for event information. We're a very large and active church, and we have a lot going on. So we want our newsletter to reflect how busy this parish is and how many things are going on so that even if you're not attending, necessarily in person, you still feel engaged and you have that opportunity for connection to see what's going on. Uh, and by having a central location for event information, um, we can uh, provide a schedule for um, ministry leaders and volunteers to submit that information. They know what date they need to get uh, Epiphany events to us. And um, they also have a process for submitting changes. So that when something changes, it doesn't just change for the person sending out the newsletter, but also the person populating our calendar on our website. And we can make sure that there isn't a stray poster or video clip that has the wrong information somewhere. Um, and that way, if information comes in late, we can offer some certainty that if it can't go in this edition, it can go in the next one because we've planned ahead. And that has been helpful. Uh, and we also, we do have tiered information uh, when we're doing content planning because there's so much of it. Uh, we're, with worship is, for instance, our first, um, uh, the first category that we would look to. And then if something is a parish-wide activity or requires long-term planning, like say a pilgrimage, um, then uh, we can assign those roles um, and make decisions in that way. And that helps me make my weekly production deadlines and also allows me to batch work. So if something needs to go in the newsletter, a version of it can also be made for social media in Hootsuite, which is what we use. And uh, also for our uh, live stream production, where we have um, promotional stuff there and like video displays in the library, what have you. And that really helps on production time. Yeah, and I'll just add that um, we have a weekly e-newsletter, um, um, and it helps to be, uh, to keep it consistent because there was a time um, a couple of years ago where we're like, oh, it's the summer, why don't we just do um, a bi-weekly newsletter instead of every week, and that'll cut down on half the work, and what we found is that everyone was confused. We were confused on what week we were publishing. Our team members were confused on when the information needed to go out. And so I'd say that um, just keep to a weekly schedule as much as you can. With the exception of this year, we did publish um, um, 
the the Friday before Christmas and then and then resumed the first Friday after the new year. So um yeah so um but yeah um it's important to keep consistent. Um did we have some um tips hold I'm seeing some questions in the chat. Is this a good time to address them? Yeah, I think for what for those that are there, absolutely. You can do that now. Excellent. Uh, let's see. I saw a question about what is the most effective day to send out your newsletter. We did look at open rates and time of day, and we use constant contact to gather that information. Uh, and we found that it's Friday when everyone is done with their week and they want to know what's happening at St. David's. Uh, how do we determine... Uh, we decided that weekly worked best for us because the, things just kept changing week to week. Uh, and the process I mentioned for submitting changes is we have a facilities management system. And uh, in order to make it possible for our facilities department to reserve a room, that you can also submit promotional information at the same time. And so uh, you just, uh, the staff or volunteers can just submit a form which we provide to them. And um, we will often follow up with email to like further discuss it, but that is the process. I do want to Katie, say, yeah, Katie. Yeah, the question about the cadence of the newsletters bi-weekly versus weekly, I think it depends so much on the audience that you have. And you will know using those analytics like, like Holt said, um, MailChimp or or Constant Contact or, or whatever platform you're using will tend to have some of those analytics that you can look at and see what the best days are. You can experiment with them also and see what kind of feedback you get from the people that are that are using your newsletter. For us, we chose bi-weekly for a number of reasons. Again, we're at a different context. We're in the diocesan context, but looking at our audience and how they needed to use the information and at what point were the natural opportunities for us to capture attention were part of why we landed on Thursday afternoon. So we're every other Thursday afternoon. It gives my folks who are going to submit all this content to me almost the whole week to do it. And we get it out just before Friday, which is the day that I don't send much out from the diocesan office. I consider it pretty much a, a lid on news for the week because I know I don't have the attention of my folks heading into the weekend. Um, so you know you know who you're sending these things out to in both um, the verbal feedback that they're going to give you, the immediate responses. We've all sent out a newsletter and had an immediate response back of, well, you changed something or you didn't do this thing right. Um, and then looking at our analytics gives us quite a bit of information. I did see a question about what if you're a smaller church or um, organization that doesn't have a staff on hand, and that's a very good question. I think um, a meeting with stakeholders regularly, even if it can't be quite as frequently as we do it, is still beneficial. Just to check in and make sure you're all providing the same message and all have the same plan. Um, and then uh, there was another question uh, about I, what about older parishioners? Oh, go ahead. I, I want to respond to the, the question about smaller positions, and maybe maybe uh, you were going to head into this with this next question also. Uh, the, the dioceses that I serve, I have nearly 100% small churches as part of my dioceses. And so all of my communication support on the ground are with congregations that you described there, Michael, in your, in your question. And what I tell them is uh, something that was mentioned before, which is that you can maximize your content to work for multiple platforms. And so if I were in a small church where I know that it's a volunteer or it's a staff person who has 50 other things to do, it would be to think about things in ways that can be maximized for your, for your platforms. So if we're going to put a photo and a blurb in the newsletter, Perfect. I'm also going to schedule that to post as content for the Facebook page or the Instagram page. There are ways to make things uh, easier for you and your workload, less expensive for you and your budget in ways that you can have really fantastic communications from a small church because you're thinking of them in that kind of way. Yeah, and to add to what I, I heard from the three of you all sharing in different contexts is this sort of the role of a communicator is, is building synergy among ministries. And I think, Katie, the way you maybe described that was 
uh, you're not having to do all of the work yourself. You can lean on other ministries that are out there. Katie, you listed examples from the church-wide office um, or church-wide organizations. Uh, Lorraine Holt, you talked about different ministries within the parish and leaning on them, but making sure that uh, you, as a communicator, you're you know, using your own lens and saying, how do we make this be smoother? How do we make sure one is related to another in our communications? How do we bring it back to a more central narrative? Um, and that's really, you know, that I think is time well spent for staff when, uh, you know, there's limited time to go around for communications tasks. Uh, any final comments on that? And then we'll turn to, to websites. Yeah, I just want to comment that um, our newsletter does take uh, quite a bit of production time, but we find that it is a really important and integral communication tool for our parish and um, and um, that we know that not every parishioner is going to read every newsletter and all the pieces that are in it. But as I mentioned before, consistency is really important. And um, we've found that if we can provide content that is um, new, exciting, fresh, different, but in a consistent format, it becomes more familiar. And it also helps them come back and look forward to the new next newsletter. Um, Holt and I, we found out that um, with our, we're currently in a renovation season. So um, we've been providing updates for our building and that is a constant section in our newsletter. And it's increased our open rate 17% because there's something new, um, not every week, but um, it's something that they have to look for. So they're like, oh, they've uh, uncovered the floor. They've revised the arches. They've, they're picking out paint things. I don't know, different things with the building. And, and that type of stuff is exciting. Um, and so um, Holt, I, I know that you had some other things to share about how we keep our newsletter fresh and engaging. Well, for our parishioners who are not particularly tech savvy, we do also include a wrap on our bulletin, which includes some of like the highlights of the week, things that people would really want to know about if they were not particularly tech savvy. We do keep it pared down so that we don't have the double production of a print version and uh, an online version. Um, and we also have a a specific effort to maintain and build a photo library. So at every event, we're taking photos that with an eye to um, not necessarily just reporting on that event, but how we might use it next year. And so how we can have a seasonal library at all times that takes a look at permissions, you know, are there children that are allowed to be in this photo and um, how we might use them as uh, Katie said, in multiple ways, we could put it on Instagram and also Facebook and, uh, the website. And we have been blessed with a parishioner who is also a professional photographer. And if you have one of those, you know, it's pretty great. I think the question about older users for me has has me kind of going on a, on a soapbox that I could stand on for, you know, a long time. So you're going to have to push me off of it, Alan. But okay. I, I think it's a, it's a falsehood that we tell us that older folks will not use technology. Uh, when we look at statistics, we look at research, we know that this actually isn't true. And so it depends a lot on where you are, it depends a lot on the community that you're in. I think there's opportunities generally um, within the life of a church to help increase technological ability of the people that are there. That's separate from a communications question, that's more of a fellowship and formation question. So I, just, I wanna name that as a possibility. I think the other piece is, how to just very practically how to reduce the amount of clicks that any person needs to do to access the newsletter. And so that's part of why I like MailChimp and Constant Contact and platforms like that so much is because the person is probably already using email. Most folks have some level of comfort with email because it's required for almost every aspect of life. And so if they're able to open the email, get the newsletter, and have it all right there without having to open a file like a PDF or any other step, you are already much more accessible than you might be otherwise. And so my, my theme with my staff is like two clicks or less. I need the instructions to be two clicks or less or else I'm gonna lose people. And I think that's a good frame of mind when you're thinking about populations that aren't so tech literate. Yeah. 
I think I'm gonna have to cut y'all off so we can switch to websites. But thank you to three of you, the three of you for insight into newsletters. Um, both of these topics or, or medium could be discussed um, for quite some time, and there are a lot of great questions in the chat uh, that we'll try to get to later on. And if not, uh, there certainly are opportunities for us to follow up on them. Um, so yeah, turning to websites, uh, Ashley and Zach, thank you for being here. Um, if y'all don't mind introducing yourselves and then uh, jumping into you know basically the same thing, but for a website, what goes into it and what are your sort of holistic content tips and any smaller technical tips you'd have to offer? Um, sure. I'm Ashley Eastup yeah. and I'm at uh, Trinity Episcopal New Orleans. I'm our communicator, sole communicator here, but I work with a great team. Um, go ahead, Zach. <laughs> And I'm Zach Nyane. Ashley was my camp counselor back in the day at Canuga, and I currently serve as the senior associate rector at St. Bartholomew's in Manhattan. Uh, when I received the Poly Bond Award, I was associate rector at All Saints Atlanta, and I come from a campus ministry background, both as a student um, and as a solo campus chaplain. So I definitely hear and sympathize with those of you who are solo pastors in your settings. And I think a lot of the uh, communication principles that I've kind of adopted over the years are certainly applicable in communities of many different sizes. So really excited to be having this conversation today. Ashley, um, you want to go first? Let me get started. Sure. sure. Um, so I came into this role in 2018, I would say, and we had just come off of a rector search. And so we had this a ton of great data because we had put together a parish profile to help find our rector. And we had just done some congregational surveys. When we did hire our rector, then we took that information and got some more parishioners together, put together a strategic plan. I will say that going into a website redesign process with a strategic plan is like gold because they're always asking you, you know, who are you? What do you want to say? What are your main tenants? Like, how do you want to communicate? And as new to the role and not wanting to have to accumulate 10 people's opinions every time they ask me this question, I had a document I could refer to and, and use. So that was really, really helpful. And I think anytime you're going into this kind of process to gather some of that data ahead of time is really informative. Um, so we also did a brand redesign at the same time. Um, so it was kind of all hands on deck. And one of our main goals for our new website was for it to be more welcoming, to be more extroverted, so to look like us out in the community or the outside of our space rather than inside of our building. Um, and then just easy to navigate, but attractive to all ages. So that we wanted like our older folks to be able to navigate it, but that when the a younger family might see our website, it looked fresh and exciting because we're a historical church, but we do have, we wanted to show that we are, um, how do I say it? Like we're historical and rooted. We have these long traditions, but we are moving and we are growing and we are flexible and we are space for all of us to like move into this living thing. So that's something we really wanted our website to say. Um, uh, by far, our website is mostly used by newcomers, I would say. So people who are checking us out for the first time, our most visited pages are the homepage, plan your visit, and our clergy staff page. So um, those are the ones I pay attention to the most. And one thing I was um, really adamant about is that I wanted our images on our website to be real pictures of us and that like the images to do the talking. So we don't could have less text and you could kind of imagine yourself in our midst. So one of the first projects we took on was to create a video for our homepage that you could kind of say, hey, if I went to church on Sunday morning, what would it look like? What would it feel like? What should I wear? <laughs> Is there kid stuff? You don't have to ask answer any of these questions and look around because you can just watch the video and it tells you. So I'm gonna show you like a few seconds of that right now. Let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, so this is right here on our home page. Um.
that's the whole thing. But um, what we really wanted to not have um, talking in our video. We thought it would last a lot longer and it would be interesting for folks to be able to put whatever they wanted to in that space and not be told what we were saying. So um, that's been a really helpful tool. And we have been told by folks that that is something that helped bring them to our community. Um, let's see, when we, our plan, our visit page is also a highly oh wait, visited page. Um, and we just have things like our worship schedule, little what to expect of how to park, um, children in church, is that okay? What we should we wear? Who's welcome to receive communion? Things like that. And um, our children's programs. Um, one thing we are also going under construction, <laughs> Lori, and so I wanted to make sure that folks knew that. And I, again, made sure that we um, changed our header images to reflect that because I want when people come to our website to know what it's going to be like when they get here. And we're not worshiping in the sanctuary. We are worshiping in the school cafeteria. So this is what it looks like. <laughs> and that's what you're going to find when you um, show up. And then I we wanted to talk a little bit about tips, right? <laughs> I guess. Yeah, some quick things that you'd recommend you find okay. useful. Yeah, um, I guess I'm, I'm just really about the images. I wanted to show you guys one other page. We did a 175-year um, stewardship campaign last year. It was our 175th year. So we had a landing page for that where we got to kind of show. This is not it. I'm sorry. Okay, never mind. Um, but we used like an old image from the 1910 of the inside of the shirt and then one from 2018. And we kind of showed this legacy of rotating images to show the history of our church. And again, like imagine yourself in that space and as part of that legacy. Um, I think that the images that you use in your website are so important. And so that one of my tips <laughs> is to invest in your images um, and that's some of the best money we've spent. So we do have a school photographer, so I am able to hire her at a reduced rate than maybe, but I'll, I love the idea of using a professional photographer in your congregation or even iPhones right now have, have so much capability to make high resolution photos. So if you have to stage a morning where you're, or you just remember, hey, this is the day we're doing a baptism. So we're also gonna get this person and this person and think of all the shots you'd like to have on your website, plan it out and have a photo day. Um, and make sure that you are changing those photos regularly to reflect the season. We also kind of go on a church calendar kind of uh, seasonal update as well. Kind of helps me, reminds me to update certain pages. Um, and I have also some resources for you about photos that I, or websites that I use to get photos if I can't find any um, of our folks. So number one, we try to have pictures of our own people, but then if, you know, you can't, there are some websites where you can get some. And one of my other tips is that you can take a stock image and change it just a little bit to make it not look like a stock image. So it fits a lot more into your website um, and just fits better. So let me just show you one more little example. I just share sound, but um, let's see. For example, I downloaded this image from Unsplash, which is a free picture of an envelope. And then with a little bit of changing the color scheme and adding our logo, it's now like a header for a subscribe page and it matches perfectly. And it looks like I made, designed that myself, but that took just a few minutes. And I used Photoshop, but you could also use tools like Canva, which are free plans or pro plans. And if you're a nonprofit, you can get the pro plan for free. Um, other things that are so little, but this balloon picture, <laughs> and then you crop it and put your logo and some text over it, and now it fits into your website, like in your brand, and it doesn't look so out of place. So those are just little tips that I use. Um, I did make a handout with links to all these websites that I use, and I will put that in the chat too for folks to use. Awesome. Thanks for that attention to detail and getting resources to, to folks at, uh, on the call. Sure. Appreciate that. Um, Zach, how about you? Yeah, well, some of the similarities between All Saints Atlanta and Trinity New Orleans are quite uncanny. We had just finished uh, calling a new rector. Uh, we had just completed a whole churchwide kind of rebranding re initiative. And we were um, uh, upgrading from ACS Classic database to Realm. So a lot of change going on. The uh, new church logo was quite controversial. 
Uh, the upgrade to Realm was not uncontroversial, but everyone agreed that we needed a new website. And so we kind of led with that. And we were very strategic when we rolled all of this out and kind of packaged it as a new website plus. And we had a big parish forum and really um, sat down to explain the rationale behind all of these changes that felt very um, radical and very fast to a lot of the um, longtime parishioners in this uh, very established congregation. So I'm going to drop a link in the chat there um, just to kind of show you how we set this up with the congregation uh, to sort of manage the change that came with this uh, new communications plan. But when it came to the website, we started out by just looking at a bunch of websites we loved all throughout uh, the Episcopal Church and other denominations. I actually scheduled a Zoom call with Ashley here because we loved Trinity New Orleans website. And then we sent out uh, requests for proposals to various companies that we were interested in. In the end, we decided to partner with Ecclesia 360, which led us through a process of naming our goals and then creating a strategy. Ecclesia 360 is kind of a template-based uh, platform or content management system. I would say that it's in the same category as Tithely websites, Faith Connector, Membership Vision, Subsplash, and I can get these links to you as well uh, to be distributed later. We, uh, given the size of All Saints, we needed something a little more robust than a do it yourself platform such as Squarespace or Weebly, but we didn't need anything quite as complex as a, as a very intricate, uh, super custom WordPress based website. So that kind of intermediate template based approach uh, ended up being uh, the right fit for us. Our goals were to demonstrate inclusivity and vibrancy. Very welcoming parish, but the old website was very uh, stodgy and kind of clunky and very uh, sort of traditional and conservative looking. We wanted to offer clear paths to engagement, both for newcomers and for members, preferencing newcomers though. And we wanted to use uh, everyday language that is accessible and invitational. Um, you know, I was walking by an urban Episcopal church several years ago and passed by a sign and it said HE to 10 a.m. And the first thing that popped in my head was hell at 10 a.m., right? <laughs> so we really wanted to de-jargonize our whole website and just completely scrub it of anything that would be foreign to someone who wasn't already a deeply committed Episcopalian. Uh, so here's the homepage of um, our website. You'll see the new logo in the left-hand corner. Um, news, events, serve, give, and then a member hub up top. Um, I completely agree with Ashley about using high quality photography. And um, one of the principles on this website is using rotating content so that we can display a vast amount of representation and diversity using more time and less space. So if you stay on the homepage long enough, you'll see all kinds of images from throughout the life of the parish, all different kinds of people, programmings, and so forth. And then if you uh, hang out on the homepage long enough, you'll see this uh, Dr. Seuss style poem, all ages and stages, races and places, nations, stations, and orientations, etc. Uh, scrolling across the screen. And so that's a way to convey that inclusivity without having to give an encyclopedic amount of uh, content and text um, right there on the homepage. Episcopalians love to say all the things all the time. And uh, this website really sought to embrace brevity and concision and just um, giving the very basic information without a lot of text. Um, a website, in my opinion, should not be an encyclopedia, nor should it really be a parish profile. This website was designed to invite people to take action right away, to make a donation, to attend a worship service, to sign up for a class or an event, uh, not so much to learn and consume uh, information. Um, we knew that from the back end uh, metrics that uh, the most popular pages and uh, information that people were looking for were worship times on Sundays, um, sermons from the previous Sunday. And so one click, you can watch uh, the most recent sermon right away from the homepage. 
um, age level programming, upcoming events, the newsletter, and then um, a bit of rotating content here that conveys our um, kind of inclusive spirit. Uh, we look for winsome ways to um, provide brand cohesion throughout. So you'll see, you know, all, all saints, saints at worship, um, all ages and stages, all the buzz featured events. Uh, read all about it, <laughs> all for Atlanta. And while kind of cutesy, um, it gives a sense that our parish has a unique identity and a story uh, to tell. Um, <clears throat> so a few uh, spe specific tips for uh, websites. Um, I believe that um, the feeling that a website uh, presents and projects and conveys is just as important as the text and information. So I think as much as you can use vibrant photography and colors, um, again, concision and brevity. We live in such an ADHD culture and time. People's online attention spans are so short. Less text, more uh, images, and more direct calls to action. The sooner you can get someone to click on a call to action, uh, the better. Um, and, um, you know, I would suggest um, going through every page of your website uh, meticulously, month by month, season by season, just to scrub old and outdated information because it can so easily accumulate uh, throughout the site. And uh, when we were building this website for All Saints, we really looked for ways that we could um, uh, sort of stock it with uh, evergreen content that never needed to change or ways that we could uh, feed in auto-populating content. And so um, the communicator, All Saints, they essentially go and post uh, the sermon in one place, and then it auto-populates the homepage and the audio video library and anywhere else that it might show up uh, throughout the website. Awesome. And I'm seeing some great uh, back and forth, actually, interaction in the chat. Um, as well for, for folks asking questions and then others uh, answering them, um, both panelists and folks just in attendance, which I, I really appreciate. Um, I do have, I want to go through two quick questions from the chat for, for both of you um, and then turn to some discussion questions for everyone. Um, first, uh, do you have recommendations for how to host a, a photo library on a website? Um, All Saints already had a long-standing um, photo library hosted on SmugMug, and so we placed a link to that here using the lens icon at the bottom next to our other social icons, and then I believe you can also find it uh, underneath the hamburger menu, and then in the media category, you can visit our photo gallery, which um, has been going on since actually 2011, 2009, um, and has event, has photos from every event throughout the year. Um, and I believe that many platforms such as SmugMug will allow you to tag your photos with various individuals or categories or topics so that, um, you know, when the uh, uh, Shrove Tuesday Pancake Supper comes up again and, uh, 2023, you can search hashtag pancakes or whatever, and then easily find uh, your previous content. Great, thanks for that. And then uh, another question, uh, hopefully quick. 80% um, of our website visits are from mobile. Do you have advice or recommendations on how to take that into consideration when building or updating your site? Um. Uh, with the provider that we use, because Ecclesia 360, it, they make it really easy to have the mobile version. So, but the most, the thing I think about the most is just not having to scroll so much. Um, so less is more in a lot of ways. Um, one thing we started doing with our newsletter, um, which I think kind of relates to websites, but I really want to take a lot of uh, text out of our emails and they were just getting really long and that does impact mobile. So we uh, created an announcements page on our website that's literally like the written out bulletin announcements for our older folks who want to go to one place. 
and read the announcements instead of having to click around. And I just put that link in the bottom of our email so I can have like photo, photo, photo link, a couple little bit, and then announcements. So if you wanna read all of the juice, like that is for you. And so that would be my biggest recommendation, I guess. Um, I'd say the same. I would say really just always testing every page that you build on mobile before pushing it out, just so you can see kind of how it folds out um, on the phone screen. And when we were building our site, I was actually uh, quite weary at first of including the uh, hamburger menu in the upper right-hand corner, but our um, uh, web company pointed out that pretty much every website folds into a hamburger menu on the mobile device. So by uh, utilizing the hamburger menu on the desktop as well, it actually gives, um, uh, you know, apples for apples navigation uh, on the phone. And most nowadays in 2023, the hamburger menu isn't going to be um, completely foreign even to older, less tech, tech savvy individuals. And and the hamburger menu is the the three bars, right? That you would click on to open up more the list of pages on the site. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And then there's a a meat option and a and a vegetarian or vegan option. <laughs> okay. I had to get a a, a silly the impossible menu. Yes. Yeah. Impossible and impossible menu. Yeah. We can be. Um, all right. So I want to open up the conversation just a bit um, to talk about the interplay between newsletters and websites, because they definitely can work hand in hand. Uh, some of the tactics that you all discussed um, were similar for both of these uh, forms of communication. So I've got a couple questions. We'll see how, how uh, far we get through them. Um, but the first is, is fairly straightforward. How can websites and newsletters work together uh, to engage your church community? I think just from a sheer practical step first step is that they should look like they're related across all of your communications everything should be branded everything should be consistent so that no matter what you're looking at newsletter website printed material bulletin it feels like it's from the specific organization or the specific congregation that you're that you're coming from um and then i think I think the other piece that I want to make sure we say that I did see in a question in the in the chat had to do with um, internal facing members versus external. How does that dynamic play out website to newsletter? I think that the folks that responded in the chat are, are right, that the website should be primarily postured toward newcomers. The newsletter might be primarily postured towards your members. The piece that I always put in when I'm working with our congregations is that uh, newcomers, it shouldn't be hard to find the newsletter for newcomers because it does tell you a lot about the life of the congregation if you're able to, to see the newsletter. And so if the only way to get on the newsletter is to like call up Sister Carol and say, hey, I'm a new person at this church, will you put my address in your list? I mean, that's kind of taking a step back of a couple decades technologically, but I have that in, in some of my congregations is to have it be an e-newsletter, have there be a really easy way to sign up straight from the website so that you don't have to know the exact right person to ask to be put on the list. Um, that that's an easy thing to do, but it's something that's often um, not thought of, especially in congregations that are smaller or have smaller staffs. Yeah, I would add to that. We recently added the kind of like first time visitor pop-up thing that Constant Contact offers to have you subscribe to the newsletter. And we have different ones you can sign up for. Like we also have a daily meditation that goes out and um, it has really increased our email list. And I think it just, when you're already there visiting, it's a quick little thing. People are used to doing it. They can unsubscribe quickly if they don't want it after a while, but it does really, it really has helped grow our newsletter. Lori, did you wanna, you've been unmuted. Did you wanna jump in? Um, just to confirm and affirm, you know, what Katie said about um, having that same brand experience that they should, they should be able to know that you are the same organization. And, and that's where the consistency again comes in to, um, to help people 
kind of know, okay, they've got their stuff together, <laughs> right? Um, and yes, at St. David's, we use our newsletter as a primarily internal communication tool um, and our website for outward facing, um, our homepage is geared toward visitors, uh, but we do have under our hamburger menu, that's where you can still get additional information um, for parishioners about additional events and event details. Um, and, and the newsletter, yes, does give a kind of a snapshot. Our, the name of our newsletter is St. David's at a Glance, and it really does show a snapshot of the life of our church. And so it really is also a very valuable um, newcomer and visitor tool to say to see that that there are things happening and it's very active and and also how do I get involved and so that's where um, it's really important to have consistency in formatting um, where we've got um, headlines subheads and then a contact and link so that for each piece if there is a call to action then it's right there um, at their fingertips. Um, Holt, did you have any other tips? We include a newcomer recognition section in the newsletter regularly. So if you come to St. David's, we offer a hot breakfast from our chef. And so you're invited to have free breakfast and also be introduced to the community through the newsletter in sort of a low, in, if you're a little bit anxious about meeting new people, they can see your photo and get to know you and um, maybe make some new friends the next time you come visit. At St. Bart's, where I currently serve, uh, we're big fans of the newsletter teaser that then drives traffic uh, to the website and also serves the interest of, you know, less text, uh, more photos. Uh, so, for instance, uh, most weeks, the e-news opens up with a word from one of our clergy, uh, which is just a little teaser. And then you can click continue reading um, and it takes you to uh, the websites where you can find a longer note from the clergy. And then all of those um, notes are uh, archived uh, in a little blog um, of clergy notes here, <clears throat> which tend to be uh, more relevant over time than uh, having a years, years and years archives of uh, full e-news uh, newsletters. And you all have uh, leaned into this already and, and again came up in the chat um, as you flagged, Katie, but any other thoughts on how it, it, the, the challenge of balancing multiple audiences and, and using these tools to reach them, the, the primary audiences being people who are already within the church, you know, and the, the sort of the needs and interests that they have, and then the broader community, anyone who may be interested in coming or even just simply other organizations that might want to work with the church. How do you all balance those uh, that, that challenge. I think from, from my context, the way that I balance that challenge is to do a lot of what Zach just described, which is to use your space in a really strategic way to understand what needs to be written out. Um, like I said, I've, I've, I have some people who print and read, and so I know the things that are going to be appropriate to, to have to be completely in the newsletter versus the things that I can do a hyperlink out on. Um, I, so, so we have various sections of, of what our newsletter is. We have calendar, which is not you know, a full blurb, it's just a line and then a link. We have a news section, which would be full blurbs. That's a very technical term, the word blurb, but it has, has the full blurbs with one to two photos per story. We have like an in case you missed it, so we send out other communications throughout the week, you know, invitations for a specific event or a specific notice from the bishop or the rector in a congregational in a congregational setting that are not, again, full blurbs. They're just hyperlinks. And so they click it, they go to another location. Um, I think that uh, one of the other ways that we have found to be effective that might work in certain contexts would be that I can't tell every story, even if they fit my content requirements, I'm not going to be able to tell every story every single week. I can incentivize our congregations or our folks if they get their their news in the, the local media 
that's an opportunity I have to do another hyperlink and to go out to a, a professional reporting of something amazing that one of our congregations or our ministries did in a way that I can highlight, you know, five to six really amazing things even before I get to news without taking up a huge amount of space. So th there are ways to look at, you know, what needs to take up a lot of time, what doesn't need to take up a lot of time, what's a big impact for, for you know, a hyperlink versus what needs to be written out. There are ways to be strategic about your sections and what kind of content fits into those sections. Great, thanks for that explanation, Katie. Um, no, looking at the time, any other uh, closing remarks before I wrap this up? Any other closing thoughts or recommendations? Yeah, I would just say that um, um, a lot of you are doing great communications and have done these things and um, and to just uh, share that work. And um, Holt and I, we're, we're relatively new to Episcopal Church Communications and we learned from seeing what other churches and parishes and organizations are doing and it, I can't tell you how many times um, we'll get a newsletter from another parish or a diocese and we're like, oh yeah, we forgot to talk about that. Or, oh, I really like how they did that. And so it's been really nice to just, even if you don't know it, you guys have helped us in um, crafting what we think is a really important tool. And so I just encourage everyone to um, to share their work and subscribe to other newsletters, check out other websites and um yeah, there's a lot of great work out there and um, and we, we enjoy what we do. Thanks yeah, no, that, Lori. I, and, oh, go ahead, oh, Ashley. I was about to put a plug in for Episcopal Communicators. <laughs> um, it's yes. a really great professional organization. I, uh, like I said, I don't have a background in um, web design or any of this and some psychology. <laughs> and it, been such an incredible resource of learning and meeting other colleagues and copying what they're doing. I mean, I think a lot of what uh, I've learned is that you can take things from other people, incorporate to make your own. Like I'm already all over that this Sunday part on the top of the All Saints website. Love that. We're going to have that soon. So um, anyway, I just think if you, if you have the means to be a member or to come to a conference, it's really, really helpful in your day-to-day. -day. Great. Thanks for that plug, Ashley. That's uh, that's where I was headed. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's just there's so many more questions, even just on newsletters and websites that came up in the chat. Uh, other topics that came up from you know communications to multilingual congregations, uh, to to um, social media, uh, other technical questions. But these are all things that uh, Episcopal communicators, as an organization, strives to help us help each other unpack. I mean, it's a great networking opportunity, uh, troubleshooting opportunity, professional development opportunity. So uh, I hope that those who are not familiar with it, who are not already members um, and tuning into this will, will consider joining. Um, and it's also a type of networking that the Fiscal Parish Network uh, leans into as well, uh, which is part of why um, we have this webinar today and the synergy, you know, coming up in the next few months of three opportunities to engage um, you've heard about them already a couple of times and seen it in the chat, but again, please consider joining the Episcopal Parish Network Conference and the pre-conference for communications that is in Jacksonville in March. Uh, and then our Episcopal Communicators Conference at Camp Allen in Texas is coming up in April. Uh, and then if, again, if you're not a member of Episcopal Communicators itself, uh, the membership link is there in the chat. Um, Lori, Holt, Katie, Ashley, and Zach, thank you all so much for your contributions today. Uh, thank you, Joe and the Episcopal Parish Network for allowing us to have this platform um, and kicking off the webinars for 2023. So with that, we'll uh, we'll close for today. Thank you. Thank you.